Chapter 15, A Godly Birthday Party, Sadie. They took Carter to a different dormitory, so I don't know how he slept, but I couldn't get a wink. It would have been hard enough with Zia's comment about passing our tests or dying, but the girls' dormitory just wasn't as posh as Amos's mansion. The stone walls sweated moisture. Creepy pictures of Egyptian monsters danced across the ceiling in the torchlight. I got a floating cot to sleep in, and the other girls in training, initiate Zia had called them, were much younger than me, so when the old dorm matron told them to go to sleep straight away, they actually obeyed. The matron waved her hand and the torches went out. She shut the door behind her and I could hear the sound of locks clicking. Lovely. Imprisoned in a nursery school dungeon. I stared into the dark until I heard the other girls snoring. A single thought kept bothering me, an urge I just couldn't shake. Finally, I crept out of bed and tugged on my boots. I felt my way to the door. I tugged at the handle, locked as I suspected. I was tempted to kick it until I remembered what Zia had done at, at, in the Cairo airport broom closet. I pressed my palm against the door and whispered, Sahad. Locks clicked. The door swung open. Handy trick. Outside, the corridors were dark and empty. Apparently, there wasn't much nightlife in the first gnome. I sneaked through the city, back the way we'd come, and saw nothing but an occasional cobra slithering across the floor. After the last couple of days, that didn't even faze me. I thought about trying to find Carter, but I wasn't sure what, where they had taken him, and honestly, I wanted to do this on my own. After our last argument in New York, I wasn't sure how I felt about my brother. The idea that he could be jealous of my life while well, he got to travel the world with dad, please. And he had the nerve to call me, and he had the nerve to call my life normal? All right, I had a few mates at school like Liz and Emma, but my life was hardly easy. If Carter made a social faux pas or met people he didn't like, he could just move on. I had to stay put. I couldn't answer simple questions like, where are your parents, or where, what does your family do, or even where are you from, without exposing just how odd my situation was. I was always the different girl. The mixed race girl, the American who wasn't American, the girl whose mother had died, the girl, who's, the girl with the absent father, the girl who made trouble in class, the girl who couldn't concentrate on her lessons. After a while, one learns that blending in is simply, it doesn't work. If people are going to single me out, I might as well give them something to stare at. Red stripes in my hair? Why not? Combat boots with a school uniform? Absolutely. Headmaster says, I'll have to call your parents, young lady. I say, good luck. Carter didn't know anything about my life. But enough of that. The point was, I decided to do this particular bit of exploring alone, and after a few wrong turns, I found my way back to the Hall of Ages. What was I up to, you may ask? I certainly didn't want to meet Monsieur, Monsieur Evil again or creepy old Lord Salamander, but I did want to see those images. Memories, Zia had called them. I pushed open the bronze doors. Inside, the hall seemed deserted. No balls of fire floated around the ceiling, no glowing hieroglyphs, but images still shimmered between the columns, washing the hall with strange multicolored light. I took a few nervous steps. I wanted another look at the age of the gods. On our first trip through the hall, something about those images had shaken me. I knew Carter thought I'd be gone. I knew Carter thought I'd gone into a dangerous trance, and Zia had warned that the scenes would melt my brain, but I had a feeling she was just trying to scare me off. I felt a connection to those images, like there was an answer within, a vital piece of information I needed. I stepped off the carpet and approached the curtain of golden light. I saw sand dunes shifting in the wind, storm clouds brewing, crocodiles sliding down the Nile. I saw a vast hall full of re revelers. I touched the image, and I was in the palace of the gods. Huge beings swirled around me, changing shape from human to animal to pure energy. On a throne in the center of the room sat a muscular African man in rich black robes. He had a handsome face and warm brown eyes. His hands looked strong enough to crush rocks. The other gods celebrated around him. Music played, a sound so powerful that the air burned. At the man's side stood a beautiful woman in white, her belly swollen as if she were a few months pregnant. Her form flickered. At times, she seemed to have multicolored wings. Then she turned in my direction and I gasped. She had my mother's face. She didn't seem to notice me. In fact, none of the gods did until a voice behind me said, are you a ghost? I turned and saw a good looking boy of about 16 dressed in black robes. His complexion was pale, but he had lovely brown eyes like the man on the throne. His black hair was long and tousled, rather wild, but it worked for me. He tilted his head and it finally occurred to me that he'd asked me a question. I tried to think of something to say. Excuse me, hello, marry me, anything would have done, but all I could manage was to shake of, was just a shake of the head. Not a ghost, eh? He amused. A ba then? He gestured toward the throne. Watch, but do not interfere. Somehow I wasn't interested in watching the throne so much, but the boy in black dissolved into a shadow and disappeared, leaving me no further distraction. 
Isis, said the man on the throne. The pregnant woman turned towards him and beamed. My lord Osiris, happy birthday. Thank you, my love. And soon we shall mark the birth of our son Horus, the great one. His new incarnation shall be his greatest yet. He shall bring peace and prosperity to the world. Isis took her husband's hand. Music kept playing around them, God celebrating, the very air swirling in a dance of, of creation. Suddenly, the palace doors blew open. A hot wind made the torches sputter. A man strode into the hall. He was tall and strong, almost a twin to Osiris, but with dark red skin, blood-colored robes, and a pointed beard. He looked human, except when he smiled. Then his teeth turned to fangs. His face flickered, sometimes human, sometimes strangely wolf-like. I had to stifle a scream because I'd seen that wolfish face before. The dancing stopped. The music died. Osiris rose from his, from his throne. Set, he said in a dangerous tone. Why have you come? Set laughed and the tension in the room broke. Despite his cruel eyes, he had a wonderful laugh. Nothing like the screeching he'd done at the British Museum. It was carefree and friendly, as if he couldn't possibly mean any harm. I come to celebrate my brother's birthday, of course, he exclaimed, and I bring entertainment. He gestured from behind him. Four huge men with the heads of wolves marched into the room, carrying a jewel-encrusted golden coffin. My heart began to race. It was the same box Set had used to imprison my dad at the British Museum. No, I wanted to scream. Don't trust him. But the assembled gods oohed and awed, admiring the box, which was painted with gold and red hieroglyphs, trimmed with, with jade and opals. The wolfmen set down the box, and I saw it had no lid. The interior was lined with black linen. This sleeping casket, Set announced, was made by my finest craftsmen using the most expensive materials. Its value is beyond measure. The god who lies within, even for a night, will see his powers increase tenfold. His wisdom will never falter. His strength will never fail. It is a gift, he, he smiled slyly at Osiris, for the one and only god who fits within it perfectly. I wouldn't have queued up first. I wouldn't have queued up first, but the gods surged forward. They pushed each other out of the way to get at the golden coffin. Some climbed in but were too short. Others were much too big. Even when they tried to change their shapes, the gods had no luck, as if the magic of the box were thwarting them. No one fit exactly. Gods grumbled and complained as others, anxious to try, pushed themselves to the floor. Set turned to Osiris with a good-natured laugh. Well, brother, we have no winner yet. Will you try? Only the best of the gods can succeed. Osiris's eyes gleamed. Apparently, he wasn't the god of brains because he seemed completely taken by the box's beauty. All the other gods looked at him expectantly, and I could see what he was thinking. If he fit in the box, what a brilliant birthday present. Even Set, his wicked brother, would have to admit that he was the rightful king of the gods. Only Isis seemed troubled. She laid her hand on her husband's shoulder. My lord, do not. Set does not bring presents. I'm offended, Set sounded genuinely hurt. Can I not celebrate my brother's birthday? Are we so estranged that I cannot even apologize to the king? Osiris smiled at Isis. My dear, it is only a game. Fear nothing. He rose from his throne. The gods applauded as he approached the box. All hail Osiris, Set cried. The king of the gods lowered himself into the box, and when he glanced in my direction, just for a moment, he had my father's face. No, I thought again, don't do it. But Osiris lay down. The coffin fit him exactly. A cheer went up from the gods, but before Osiris could rise, Set clapped his hands. A golden lid materialized above the box and slammed down on top of it. Osiris shouted in rage, but his cries were muffled. Golden latches fastened around the lid. The other gods surged forward to intervene. Even the boy in black I'd seen earlier reappeared, but Set was faster. He stamped his foot so hard the stone floor crumbled. The stone floor trembled. The gods toppled over each other like dominoes. The wolfmen drew their spears, and the gods scrambled away in terror. Set had a magic word, said a magic word, and a boiling cauldron appeared out of thin air. It poured its contents over the coffin, molten lead, coating the box, sealing it shut, probably heating the interior to a thousand degrees. Villain, Isis wailed. She advanced on Set and began to speak a spell, but Set held up his hand. Isis rose from the floor, clawing at her mouth, her lips pressed as if an invisible force were suffocating her. Not today, lovely Isis, Set purred. Today I am king, and your child shall never be born. Suddenly, another goddess, a slender woman in a blue dress, charged out of the crowd. Husband, no! She tackled Set, who momentarily lost his concentration. Isis fell to the floor, gasping. The other gods yelled, flee! Isis turned and ran. Set rose. I thought he would hit the goddess in blue, but he only snarled, foolish wife, whose side are you on? He stamped his foot again, and the golden coffin sank into the floor. Set ran af raced after Isis. At the edge of the palace, Isis turned into a small bird of prey and soared into the air. Set sprouted demon's wings and launched himself in pursuit. 
Then suddenly I was the bird. I was Isis flying desperately over the Nile. I could sense set behind me, closing. Closing, you must escape, the voice of Isis said in my mind. Avenge Osiris, crown Horus king. Just when I thought my heart would burst, I felt a hand on my shoulder. The images evaporated. The old master, Iskandar, stood, be stood beside me, his face pinched with concern. Glowing hieroglyphs danced around him. Forgive the interruption, he said in perfect English, but you were almost dead. That's when my knees turned to water and I lost consciousness. When I awoke, I was curled at Iskandar's feet on the steps below the empty throne. We were alone in the hall, which was mostly dark except for the light from the hieroglyphs that seemed to glow around him. Welcome back, he said. You're lucky you survived. I wasn't so sure. My head felt like it had been boiled in oil. I'm sorry, I said. I didn't mean to. Look at the images? And yet you did. Your ba left your body and entered the past. Hadn't you been warned? Yes, I admitted, but I was drawn to the pictures. Mm, Iskandar star stared into space as if remembering something from long ago. They are hard to resist. You speak perfect English, I noticed. Iskandar smiled. How do you know I'm speaking English? Perhaps you were speaking Greek. I hoped he was kidding, but I couldn't tell. He seemed so frail and warm, and yet it was like sitting next to a nuclear reactor. I had a feeling he was full of more danger than I wanted to know. You're not really that old, are you? I asked. I mean, old enough to remember Ptolemaic times? I am exactly that old, my dear. I was born in the reign of Cleopatra VII. Oh, please. I assure you it's true. It was my sorrow to behold the last days of Egypt before that full hearted that foolhardy queen lost our kingdom to the Romans. I was the last magician to be trained before the house was underground. Many of our powerful secrets were lost, including the spells my master used to extend my life. Magicians these days still live long, sometimes centuries, but I have been alive for two millennia. So you're immortal? His chuckle turned into a, ra a, ra a racking cough. He doubled over and cupped his hands over his mouth. I wanted to help, but wasn't sure how. The glowing hieroglyphs flickered and dimmed around him. Finally, the coughing subsided. He took a shaky breath. Hardly immortal, my dear. In fact, his voice trailed off. But never mind that. What did you see in your vision? I probably should have kept quiet. I didn't want to be turned into a bug for breaking any rules, and the vision had terrified me, especially the moment when I changed into the bird of, a, of prey. But Iskandar's kindly expression made it hard to hold back. I ended up telling him everything. Well, almost everything. I left out the bit about the good-looking boy, and yes, I know it was silly, but I was embarrassed. I reckon that part could have been my own crazed imagination at work, as ancient gods, Egyptian gods could not have been that gorgeous. Iskandar sat for a moment, tapping his staff against the steps. You saw a very old event, Sadie, Set taking the throne of Egypt by force. He hid Osiris's coffin, you know, and Isis searched the entire world to find it. She got him back eventually? Not exactly. Osiris was resurrected, but only in the underworld. He became the king of the dead. When their son Horus grew up, Horus challenged Set for the throne of Egypt and won after many hard battles. That is why Horus was called the Avenger. As I said, an old story, but one that the gods have repeated many times in our history. Repeated? The gods follow patterns. In some ways, they are quite predictable, acting out the same squabbles, the same jealousies down through the ages. Only the settings change and the hosts. There was that word again, hosts. I thought about the poor woman in the New York Museum who turned into the goddess Serket. In my vision, I said, Isis and Osiris were married. Horus was about to be born as their son. But in another story, Carter told me, all three of them were siblings, children of the sky goddess. Yes, Iskandar agreed. This can be confusing for those who do not know the nature of gods. They cannot walk the earth in their pure form, at least not for more than a few moments. They must have hosts. Humans, you mean? Or powerful objects, such as statues, amulets, monuments, certain models of cars. But they prefer human form. You see, gods have great power, but only humans have creativity, the power to change history rather than simply repeat it. Humans can, how do you modern say it? Er, think outside the cup? The box, I suggested. Yes, the combination of human creativity and godly power can be quite formidable. At any rate, when Osiris and Isis first walked the earth, their hosts were brother and sister. But mortal hosts are not permanent. They die, they wear out. Later in history, Osiris and Isis took new forms, humans who were husband and wife. Horus, who in one lifetime was their brother, was born into a new life as their son. That's confusing, I said, and a little gross. Iskandar shrugged. The gods do not think of relationships the way we humans do. The ho their hosts are merely like changes of clothes. That is why the ancient stories seem so mixed up. Sometimes the gods are described as married or siblings or parent and child, depending on their hosts. 
The Pharaoh himself was called a living God, you know. Egyptologists believe that this, this was just a lot of propaganda, but in fact, it was often literally true. The greatest of the Pharaohs became hosts for gods, usually Horus. He gave them power and wisdom and let them build Egypt into a mighty empire. But that's good, isn't it? Why is it against the law to host a god? Iskandar's face darkened. Gods have different agendas than humans do, Sadie. They can overpower their hosts, literally, literally burn them out. That is why so many hosts die young. Tutankhamun, poor boy, died at 19. Cleopatra VII was even worse. She tried to host the spirit of Isis without knowing what she was doing, and it shattered her mind. In the old days, the House of Life taught the use of divine magic. Initiates could study the path of Horus or Isis or Sekhmet or any of the gods, learning to channel their powers. We had, more, we had many more initiates back then. Iskandar looked round the empty hall as if imagining it filled with magicians. Some adepts could call upon the gods only from time to time. Others attempted to host their spirits with varying degrees of success. The ultimate goal was to become the eye of the god, a perfect union of the two souls, mortal and immortal. Very few achieved this, even among the pharaohs who were born to the task. Many destroyed themselves trying. He turned up his palm, which had the most deeply etched lifeline I'd ever seen. When Egypt finally fell to the Romans, it became clear to us, to me, that mankind, our rulers, even the strongest magicians, no longer had the strength of will to master our god's power. The only ones who could, his voice faltered. What? Nothing, my dear. I talk too much. An old man's weakness. It's the blood of the pharaohs, isn't it? He fixed me in his gaze. His eyes no longer looked milky. They burned with intensity. You are a remarkable young girl. You remind me of your mother. My, my mouth fell open. You knew her? Of course, she trained here, as did your father. Your mother, well, aside from being a brilliant scientist, she had the gift of divination, one of the most difficult forms of magic, and she was the first in centuries to, to possess it. Divination? Seeing the future. Tricky business, never perfect, but she saw things that made her seek advice from unconventional places, things that made even this old man question some long-held beliefs. He drifted off into memory land again, which was un infuriating enough when my grandparents did it. But when it's an all-powerful magician who has valuable information, it's enough to drive one mad. Iskandar, he looked at me with mild surprise as if he'd forgotten I was there. I'm sorry, Sadie. I should come to the point. You have a hard path ahead of you, but I'm convinced now it's a path you must take for all our sakes. Your brother will need your guidance. I was tempted to laugh. Carter, need my guidance for what? What path do you mean? All in good time, things must take their course. Typical adult answer. I tried to bite back my frustration. And what if I need guidance? Zia, he said without hesitation. She is my best pupil and she is wise. When the time comes, she will know how to help you. Right, I said a bit disappointed. Zia, for now you should rest, my dear, and it seems I too can rest at last. He sounded sad but relieved. I didn't know what he was talking about, but he didn't give me a chance to ask. I'm sorry our time together was so brief, he said. Sleep well, Sadie Kane. But Iskandar touched my forehead, and I fell into a deep, dreamless sleep.